Oh, right. I'm going to sit over here. Our panel for this uh, continuing the energy summit. Um, we have Abdul Rahman Al Faqi, the CEO of SABIC Saudi Arabia. Please have a seat. Sit, 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 sit. Uh, in the middle, Catherine McGregor, the CEO of Angie in France, and Henri Poupart Lafarge, the chairman of the board and CEO of Alstom in France. Now, the title, the title is energy so fast tracking next gen fuel. What does that mean, Catherine? This means that um, <laughs> we need to go fast, sense of urgency. Uh, and here I'm putting my energy hat on. Uh, so we have to develop this uh, energy system of the future, which has to be low carbon, just to be affordable and resilient. And for that, you're going to need a lot of electrons and also a lot of molecules. And I know the gentleman in the previous panel used that phrase. I am passionate about this phrase because people sometimes think that everything will be electrification. I don't think it will be the case. I think you need to have a balanced system with electrons and molecules. So hydrogen. Hydrogen, among others, but there are others. Biomethane, for example, can be one of those molecules. Hydrogen and derivatives from hydrogen. And why is it important, Richard? Because the molecules can reuse a lot of the existing infrastructures. And when we talk about energy transition, you need to minimize the cost of additional infrastructure. When people think about electrification, one of the biggest challenges is transmission. Transmission, transmission. So when you develop low carbon molecules, you are able to use and reuse existing infrastructure, which helps alleviate this massive challenge of transmission. Right, but, but I could arguably say, uh, trans, for, 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 for transmission with electricity or electrification, you've got distribution with hydrogen and how you actually get it around. But what are you doing with hydrogen? I mean, you're, you're, you're doing trains. Yes, I'm doing trains. Uh, as, you, as you know, the mobility sector has started its transition quite late as compared to the energy. So fast tracking is really to catch up uh, for this transition. And what we want to do is to decarbonize trains. You may be surprised, but half of the network in Europe is not electrified. The vast, vast majority of the network in the US is not electrified. 80% of the network in this region is not electrified. So we need to find a solution, a new uh, fuel, uh, in, in order to decarbonize these diesel trains. And we have opted for the hydrogen train. And I'm very happy and very proud to see that our hydrogen train, which is running in, in Germany already, day to day, in service, is here in Riyadh and will be showcased on Sunday. So we will have a demonstration of the hydrogen train. So, so it works. So to those of us who are not as, who don't cover energy in quite the same way as others, as others you have a hydrogen chain running in Germany. We have two lines of hydrogen trains in service every single day. People are commuting to go to work in hydrogen trains. With the hydrogen uh, produced where? So, an hydrogen which is produced locally, uh, in Germany, of course. Uh, of course, that's a, complete, uh, that's a good point, that's a complete system. You cannot isolate the trains from the complete supply chain, the fueling station, the production of hydrogen, green hydrogen, blue hydrogen. And this is where the kingdom has, has a very strong role to play, because we have everything here uh, in order to build this supply chain and the usage of the hydrogen through trains. You, are, you, you have an advantage here, in a sense, if you have the funds to develop and to introduce this, this new technology. We have more than the funds, Richard. I think we are using the hydrogen for, some, for a couple of things. The first one, it is use it as a fuel. We already use it as a fuel. We use it to produce uh, chemicals, like methanol and ammonia, and we use it mainly right now to decarbonize our footprint. And the hydrogen is one of the best molecules right now that can decarbonize our processes and our operations. How easy slash cheap <laughs> is it to manufacture and produce hydrogen? And how easy will it be to take it to scale? 
It depends on which color you are talking about. Ah, oh, isn't yes. it John Defteria said? Eh? Exactly. So if it is the blue one, I think it is one of the cheapest here in Saudi Arabia. The same thing in the green one. I think the best the cheapest that you can find that we can produce it here also in Saudi Arabia. Uh, because, I mean, we have the resources. Let me just pause you for one please, second. Next please. Way. Does everybody know the difference between green, blue and different hydrogen? White and... Chairman of SAVIC. Well, oh, yes, you do. Does anybody not know the difference? <laughs> right. In a sentence, what's the difference? It is all hydrogen. It is the same molecules. It is H2. No different. It depends on the source. Where does it come from? So if it's come from an oil and gas, they call it blue. If it's come from water, it is green. If it has come from nuclear, it is whatever you want to call it. If it's come from underground, it's white. But it's all hydrogen. It's all hydrogen. Do you have a preference which hydrogen you use? Well, actually, blue hydrogen can come from oil and gas with carbon capture. So my preference is to come from decarbonized hydrogen, whether it's green directly from renewable electricity or whether it's blue with uh, carbon capture, then you know, it's, it's a good hydrogen. Emissions, that's what matters. The emissions emissions yeah. of CO2 when producing hydrogen. Now, certain companies can have preferences. So, for example, Engie, we're not an oil and gas company. We are a utility power renewable company. So, we will have a preference to produce green hydrogen because we are more relevant. And indeed, uh, the potential here in Saudi, in the kingdom, is significant because of the resources we can have in renewables. Renewable, the, the hydrogen cost. 60% of it comes from the cost of electricity when it comes to the green hydrogen. Therefore, when you can have a lot of affordable renewables, you drop the cost of the molecules that you produce. Even those hydrogen that you are producing right now from oil and gas, it's going to be green because you are going to capture the whole CO2 that is out of this process, so it's become like a green one. Yeah, but a carbon capture is very difficult and very expensive. No, <laughs> we have done it. And we will do it. At scale, it is At expensive. A, uh, look, SAVIC has the largest carbon dioxide capturing here in Saudi Arabia, 500,000 metric ton per year. And we, we utilize that in a very specific, in beverages, in chemicals. Yes, we use that CO2. You provide to the, to the, to the degree that you could use it in the beverage and in the desalination. So it is very useful product. Yes, it can be expensive in right. some other areas. I agree with you. In the, in the toolbox of next generation fuels, yes. solar, uh, wind. wind, waves in some cases, um, where does hydrogen fit? It is, it is among of them and it is the most expensive and the most risky one. Very most ris risky. High risk in terms of safety. It is unsafe at this point of time. It needs a lot of innovations. What? A lot of, techno a lot of technologies that you could but use it safely, you could transport it safely, you could store it safely. He's running trains with it. Yeah, you can, but it, it, it needs it, it need to have it in a more safe way. If you want to transport it between regions, it was very, very difficult. Yeah, first, we should not forget that hydrogen is a way to transport energy. Hydrogen, per se, does not produce the energy, but it's a very convenient and, and very light way to transport energy. In terms of volume, it takes a lot of volume, and therefore there are some challenges, in particular uh, in the aviation or in the heavy power locomotives for us, for example. But in terms of weight, it's extremely, uh, extremely efficient. And just to react to that, I mean, the, uh, the safety authorities in Germany, which are not known to be extremely... Uh, lenient have approved uh, and have approved the train. So they, there are ways of securing uh, the safety, both of the fueling stations, because of course it's important, but as well as uh, the mobile, the train in itself. So I'll go back to the safety one. You might use it in the trains, but how can you use it in the cars and everywhere? How can you use it in the houses? How can you use it everywhere? Yeah. So it's need to have a lot of measures for safety to be used. You know, maybe another perspective I want to bring regarding hydrogen is that, you know, in this system that we are building, a lot of renewables, one aspect that needs to be developed to complement the intermittency of renewables is flexibility. 
you need to bring assets which will provide the flexibility to the grid, which means that they can be dispatched on a very short notice. And what's very interesting is today the flexibility is brought by typically gas assets, batteries, of course, you know, huge potential for batteries. But hydrogen, given the flexibility that, that electrolyzer who produces the hydrogen will bring, will become potentially provider of this flexibility. So what happens is that if you have too much wind in the North Sea, for example, and you don't need all this power, you can use the electrolyzer to store the energy under the form of hydrogen. This energy is stored, it's a molecule, so you can store it, you can transport it, you can transform it, and this will contribute to the resiliency of the electricity system that we are building. But, but we have a challenge with the uh, electrolyzers. Few of them in the world, with, it's very hard to scale it up. I, are you in favor of hydrogen? <laughs> Uh, I'm in favor of chemicals because I run SABIC and of course hydrogen is a chemical, so I'm in favor of all chemicals. You don't know. Oh, you have supporters. <laughs> um, isn't there a truth in all of this? We are, this is, the, all these new generation or next generation, but we're still going to need oil and gas and fossil fuel in large numbers for the foreseeable future. Well, just, I mean, to come back to this debate, I mean, it, it, it is an emerging technology. It's a not totally mature technology. So let's not compare it with a totally mature technology. We are going to work on that. I mean, I mean all, all of us in this room, a few years ago, nobody could have predicted that the solar will, will get to grid parity. I mean, if you take 10 years ago, nobody could have predicted that. So we need to be very modest in the way this technology will evolve. Uh, it's true that there is a, a step in terms of efficiency for electrolyzers, a step in terms of cost for, for, for producing hydrogen, for consuming hydrogen, but that's a, a moment where we should showcase, experiment, complete system to make this technology more mature. I mean, it's... Right, but who, who then bears the responsibility and thereby the cost of the risk and the cost of developing these things. Um, uh, Catherine, who do you want to pay? Because you're prepared to put your euro into the pot, but you want the government... Well, we need frameworks that gives us the visibility, that gives us a market that functions. And once we have these rules, some stability, we can operate because we can make, or today, yeah, including, by the way, in this complicated interest rate environment, we can make good renewable projects work for our customers through PPA, so we sell the energy directly to them. They're very pleased because they want green electrons, they want the visibility, they want to know the price. So we are finding customers for these renewable projects, so we are contributing in obviously decarbonizing the mix, and we are able to develop and make those projects with the right returns for our company and for shareholders. But as you go to the next level of requiring things like hydrogen or uh, others that will have to be, there needs to be greater investment, mm -hmm. and I wonder who bears the brunt of that cost? And, and for hydrogen, to be honest, what we need also is regulation, mm -hmm. settlement on this discussion on colors, and you talked about the colors. I think we need to go back to CO2 emissions and just look at what, how polluting is this hydrogen, and for the least polluting, then have more subsidies, more help, having a common, techno, a common terminology, I would say, on hydrogen, which is not the case today. Everybody has their point of view, which obviously doesn't help the emergence of a global market, because we are going to need to see the emergence of a global market. You know, we have enjoyed, as you know, in Europe, the flexibility of LNG that has helped us in this gas crisis that we've just experienced. So the idea is that, hey, this H2 market, if we can manage to get it global, it would be fantastic to help bring resilience to the system. It, but for that, you need to have a common ground, you have to have a common terminology, common regulation, yeah. and frankly, we are far from that. Ah, going to the cost, I want to bring some reality and facts of the figures, but don't tell me that I'm against hydrogen, by the way. But this is what happened. Hydrogen cost in 2021 was about $3 per kg. You're talking about $300 per tonne. You know, now in 2023, the cost between five to eight dollars per kg. So that means the cost has been increasing and the innovation and the technology has not come to the point that it can reduce that cost to why the level that... Why has it gone up? 
because the innovation and technology has not helped in order to reduce that cost. And also that there is a demand that is starting in that hydrogen. This is turning into similar, you know, aviation is a subject I know something about, but the arguments over SAF, sustainable aviation fuel, that can't be produced in sufficient numbers and can't be produced at a cost that the airlines would find that the, 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 they can pass on the cost to the passengers. If I may, there's a, a fundamental difference today between the hydrogen trains and SAF. Is that SAF is today, it's not a technology today. I mean, there is no plane running today. So it's, we don't have any clear technology and clear roadmap to get a plane in the coming months and years. Hydrogen, it's, the technology is working. So it's more how we can make it more efficient. So it's more mature in that respect uh, than what is SAF. I mean, how to make it more efficient, more scalable. And that's what we are doing. And that we want to uh, work with all our partners. Uh, but the technology is there. And we right, know I think I, when, I, sorry, when I'm talking about SAF in aviation, I'm talking about the biofuels. Ah, biofuel, the, yeah. the, the biofuels that are currently being used, but in, you know, for a small percentage. Yeah. But what it's taught me is that these are great ideas, but they're very expensive to introduce, and someone has to pay for it. Yeah, and, and biofuel will only be a small share of SAF. What you will need also is to have e kerosene of yeah. some kind, so again, derivative of hydrogen to resensitize the biofuel or the e-fuel. So it, you will need a, a mix of solutions as always. But, but back to my point, we really need to, to take into account that the mobility sector has just started this transition. So again, remember what it was at the beginning of the energy transition. There were a lot of instruments, again, how to push solar panels where they were costing like four times greater than uh, oil, how to push wind, and so forth. So you have always a mix of public subsidies, private funds uh, which want to invest in the technology of the future, maybe some regulation which are also helping some transition uh, of the energy. So the mobility is just at the beginning of that, uh, and uh, we have seen that for electrical cars in Europe with a, a new regulation pushing in one direction. So. All, all, all that is going to be developed in the coming years and coming decades. We need to, uh, to catch up, hence uh, this issue of fast track. We need really to, to, go, to go fast. Can we do it? Can we create... I mean, well, not, yes, we can do it, I suppose. Is it, is it realistic? Well, do we have the choice? We need to find, the, 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 in terms of mobility, we need to, to find the right mix. I'm personally convinced that we, we are not going to get to this uh, mobility transition without a modal shift. So the share of the different modes of transportation will have to move, uh, in particular toward trains, which are... Uh, which is good for you. Which is good for the population, for, for, for us as well, but for the population primarily. And I think that that is being recognized. So, that it's not going to be to be one size fits all, one single fuel, one single solution. Uh, it's uh, a way to reinvent mobility, a way to reinvent uh, different modes of transportation themselves, one by one, right. their share of different modes. We're just about out of time. Optimistic. Yes, we can do it. Sorry? Yes, we can do it. Okay. Optimistic? Very optimistic. But in the downtrend of the economy, sometimes it is hard to say I'm uh, optimistic. But for the fuel, especially for the mix fuel and for the energy transition, I'm very optimistic. But I'll tell you one thing. Why we are talking about hydrogen now? Most of the people think that we are talking about hydrogen because it is going to decarbonize the emissions and the carbon footprint of the industry. It is one of the solutions, by the way. There are so many other solutions. Circular carbon economy is one of the most right. important things. And by the way, the circular carbon economy, the first one that has announced it here in Saudi Arabia, our king, the custodian of the Holy Mosque, has announced it during the presidency of the G20. So that's one of the solutions. So you're optimistic? Optimistic. Yes, optimistic. Timing might be a little bit uh, elastic, but I'm very optimistic about it. Give me an hour. Are we talking weeks, months, decades? 
we have to be a bit patient, but we'll get there. I'll tell you that as decades. Okay. Decades. <laughs> I'm very optimistic. I think most of the networks for Ample have set as a target in 2035 to get rid of the diesel trains. We'll, we'll get there. And for all of you who are going to take uh, the hydrogen trains, in addition, it's much more comfortable than the diesel one because it does not vibrate, it's very smooth. And it doesn't smell. So it does not smell. So, uh, so you see, it also improves the passenger experience. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, I look forward to doing an interview with you all on a hydrogen train. <laughs> exactly. Thank you very much. Thank you.